Well, between old and new teleology, count on Montpetit's principle of least action. In the transcendental analytic of the critique of pure reason and subsequently in the metaphysical foundations of natural science, Immanuel Kant clearly distinguishes his critical project from teleological thinking and the closely related physical theology. At the same time, in the appendix to the transcendental dialectic, he explicates the systematic unity of a teleological connection, as he writes, referring to concrete examples from natural science, such as chemistry, astronomy, biology, empirical psychology, and physical geography. In doing so, the decisive point of reference is Pierre-Louis Moreau de Montpetit, although not mentioned by name. With his principle of least action, introduced in the 1740s, he significantly changed the debate about the status of final causes and the possibility of teleology in natural science. Fully aware of the importance of his principle, Montpetit defended his conception as new teleology against the old forms. In terms of the principle and its specific status in Montpetit's theory, both continuities and breaks in Kant's conception of teleology can be reconstructed. Starting with the universal natural history and theory of heavens, Kant develops an old teleology, which was disqualified by Montpetit and defends it based on the solar system. In the appendix to the transcendental dialectic, Kant transforms teleology into a methodology but develops systematically incompatible approaches. On the one hand, Kant reduces the regulative principles to mere auxiliary means of the principles of understanding, thus taking away their transcendental dignity. On the other hand, he mixes two concepts of final causes which were strictly differentiated by Montpetit as old and new teleology. Not until the critique of the power of judgment will these contradictions be resolved, but without dropping the claim made against Montpetit. Despite the increasing interest in the systematic relevance of the appendix to the transcendental dialectic and its importance for Kant's conception of natural science, the numerous historical sources for the regulative use of reason have not yet been investigated. One of these sources, will be examined in the following on the basis of the principle of least action in order to discuss a systematic problem which lies in the possibility or the status of teleology in the framework of the first critique. In research, it has already been drawn attention to the mixture of various teleological approaches in the appendix. Based on that basis, the status of regulative principles or ideas is controversial and discussed, as McNulty has shown, as categorical system and recently also as an ideational interpretation. The reference to Montpetit allows me to develop an historical-based criterion by which it becomes clear that all three positions in the question of the status of teleological principles have text immanent proofs, but also systematic explanation deficits. For this reason, it can be shown where Kant's so-called unsolved problem in, of the appendix lies and why it still remains a problem worthy of investigation, as he writes in paragraph 60 of the Prolegomena. Here you can see the content of my presentation. I will start with the first part, teleology and critique, second, historical sources for Kant's concept of teleology, Kant's examination of Montpetit's principle of least action, and fourth, I will come back to the problem, the unsolved problem of the first critique. Section one, teleology and critique of pure reason. In contrast to the antinomy and its resolution and the critique of the power of judgment, the function of the concepts of reason and their importance with respect to the principles of understanding or the re relationship between teleology and mechanics do not receive any explicit clarification in the critique of pure reason. 
In the transcendental analytic, as well as in the subsequent examinations of the prolegomena, Kant formulates that the principles of understanding are sufficiently necessary conditions of experience and does not develop the regulative use of reason in the metaphysical foundations of natural science as an immanent principle. At the same time, however, the regulative use of reason is introduced as indispensably necessary and lacking that no sufficient mark of empirical truth would be possible. Consequently, the principles of understanding are necessary but not solely sufficient conditions for experience and depend on the regulative use of reason. Based on this indeterminacy of the necessity of teleological connections in the context of the first critique, the respective research positions are also controversial. Schematically sketched three interpretations, that is the categorical, the system, and the ideational one can be distinguished. Following categorical reading, most prominently introduced by Friedman 1992, all laws that are presented in the forms of necessity are indirectly related to the principles of understanding. Systematicity is therefore only an additional auxiliary means for the laws of experience, which, however, does not have an independently founded status. Following the system reading, a position presented, represented, for example, by Buchdahl, Kitscher, or Rush, the connection of concepts in a hierarchy of scientific judgments and their approximation to an ideal form its own source for necessary laws. Thus, it is to be explained independently of the principles of understanding. Following the ideational reading, a position recently introduced, for example, by McNulty, the ideas gained via the transcendental principles of reason are apodictically applied in the sense of an as if and form their own source of a priori laws. Well, the categorical, the system, and the ideational reading thus form three interpretations of the status of regulative principles and their relationship to constitutive one a problem that remains unresolved in the first critique of pure reason, as I have mentioned. This ambiguity has its origin in the fact that Kant does not strictly separate various historical established teleological concepts and mix them in his own elaboration in the appendix. To see that, it is important to reconstruct Kant's sources for his concept of teleology. Well, here you can see the three positions in the debate about the status of regulative principles, the categorical, the system, and the ideational reading. Section two, historical sources for Kant's concept of teleology. In the development of the systematic unity of nature in the appendix, Kant refers more than in other passages of the critique of pure reason to concrete results of natural science. He writes, we also find this transcendental presupposition of the systematic unity of nature hidden in an admirable way in the principles of the philosophers, although they have not always recognized it in nature or admitted it to themselves. Out of quotation. Accordingly, this precondition form, a, and this is another long quotation you can find in the PowerPoint slide, this precondition forms a this precondition forms a scholastic rule or logical principle without which there could be no use of reason because we can infer from the universal to the particular only on the ground of the universal properties of things under which the particular properties stand. But that such unanimity is to be encountered even in nature is something the philosophers presuppose in the familiar scholastic rule that one should not multiply beginnings principles without necessity. Entia preta necessitate non esse multiplicanda. It is thereby said that the nature of things themselves offer material for the unity of reason. In this passage, Kant explicitly refers to the principle that becomes known in early modern times as Occam's razors, razor. The actual point of reference, however, is Montpertuis, although he is not mentioned by name. Kant studied Montpertuis 
essay de cosmologie from 1751, which was translated into German as Versuch einer Kosmologie, even before he published the universal natural history and theory of heavens. With the principle of least action presented in the essay, Maupertuis developed a mathematical reformulation of the scholastic principle of parsimony. According to this highest principle, bodies collide with each other and thereby the movement is distributed so that the quantity of action which presupposes the change that has taken place is as small as possible. This is the English translation of the German and French um, quotes from the essay you can find on the handout. This describes the physical quantity of the action which is consumed during the transition from one point to another. The actual transition is realized on that path which assumes the least action. According to Maupertuis conviction, the principle overcomes the assumption of primary forces by contrasting the concept of efficiency with a final approach, the principle of least action. The goal is to reduce physics to the collision of bodies which can be derived from the principle of least action. In order to distinguish his idea of a final cause from other teleological approaches, Maupertuis starts his essay with a critique of teleology and physical theology. He writes, and you can find it again in German and French uh, on the PowerPoint slide, we find so many proofs of an omnipotent and omniscient being that it is somewhat more necessary to reduce the number of them than to seek to increase them and to make a choice among these proofs. Really important in this context, to make a choice among these proofs. Maupertuis makes such a choice by schematically distinguishing two forms of teleological thinking and their structural evidence. Explicitly, an old teleology is distinguished from a new one, which is introduced by, based on the principle of least action. With regard to research, we find Montpetuis' normative loaded distinction also in the terms of naive versus formal teleology or impulsive papers as ideographic and nomothetic teleology. What is an old teleology for Montpetuis? From Montpetuis' point of view, the argumentative structure of an old teleology refers in its proof to the sparks of wisdom and ability we see scattered in finite beings. These are proofs of God's existence, which the old one derived from the beauty, order, and construction of the world by taking their starting point in the construction of animals or plants, the structure of the earth, and the immensity of the celestial bodies, as Montpetit writes. Following his criticism, teleology cannot be based on individual phenomena, but rather on general laws. He writes, and you find it again on the PowerPoint slide, a true philosopher must neither be blinded by those parts of the world from which order and agreement shine forth, nor swayed by those which he does not discover. Out of quotation. The supreme being is therefore, and this is another quotation, not to be sought in the separate and small parts of the world whose relation to one another we know too little. It is found in the first laws and channel rules and not in phenomena which are nothing but too complicated consequences of these laws. End of quotation. Well, Maupertuis introduces in this sense an instrumentalist standpoint, and the principle of least action builds a second order law that allows him to derive other specific laws which are known and confirmed by experience. This is the last quotation from Maupertuis. Section three, Kant's examination of Maupertuis' principle of least action. In the universal natural history and theory of heavens, Kant agrees on the one hand with Maupertuis' criticism of the old teleology. In this sense, he shares Maupertuis' concern to develop a teleology in the field of biology. On the other hand, the paper from 1755 represents a large-scale attempt to rehabilitate the old teleology in the case of the solar system. 
among all things contrives, among all things in nature, whose first case we can investigate the origin of the world system and the generation of heavenly bodies together with the causes of their motions is the one which we might first hope to understand thoroughly and reliably. End of quotation. Accordingly, the universal natural history can also be read as an alternative to the principle of least action, as becomes clear when Kant claims with regard to Montpetit's criticism of the old theology, and I quote Kant, I shall destroy this difficulty. Kant outlines his own project as follows. You can find it on the slide. I quote Kant, it seems to me that in a certain sense, one could say here without being being presumptuous. Give me matter and I will build the world out of it. That is, give me matter and I will show you how a world is to come into being out of it. End of quotation. Kant characterizes here, and this is quite interesting, his own project and theory nearly in the same words as Montpetit describes Cartesian cosmology referring to Voltaire's parody. parody. You can see that on the handout. This is a quote from the essay. Thus, Kant positions his natural history in the context of a thinker who is directly attacked by Montpetit. Furthermore, with his writing from 1755, Kant addresses a case in relation to which Montpetit believes that he has demonstrated Newton the limitation of old teleological thoughts. Although Kant processes a different, a completely different solution than that of Newton, he positions his concept again in the context of a thinker attacked directly by Montpetit. The universal natural history and theory of heavens represents, if not a counterexample, at least an alternative to Montpetit's new teleology. The paper also forms the starting point of a defense of a teleological concept based on individual cases that can be traced throughout Kant's entire writing, although it is in a state of constant transformation. Despite the increasing discrediting of teleology in the context of physics toward the end of the 18th century, the question of its function and structure is an unsolved problem for Kant. In the appendix 1781, his approach oscillates between a reduction of systematicity to a mere auxiliary means of the principles of understanding a purposeful explanation of individual natural phenomena and nature as the lawful connection of our ideas. That is, between an abolition of final causes and the old and new teleology characterized by Montpetit. To show you that we can find in both parts of the appendix, both mental figures, that means the old and new form of teleology Montpetit has in mind, I will give you some quotes of, of from part one and part two and differentiate these mental figures in Kant's conceptions of teleology. I start with the first one, final causes of specific phenomena. That is what Montpetit has in mind when he speaks about old teleology. The ideas or principles of reason have an ideographic function when they become a rule of possible experience. Kant writes, It is thereby said that nature of things themselves offers material for the unity of reason. Based on this consideration, systematic unity as pertaining to the objects itself is assumed a priori as necessary. End of quotation. Thus, Purposiveness is not the second order principle of the cognition of understanding, but is developed based on individual cases and likewise applied to them. In the first part of the appendix to the transcendental dialectic, Kant contrasts, in this sense, the apodictic use of reason with a hypothetical one. In the latter, the particular is the certain and the universal is assumed only problematically. In the course of the hypothetical use of reason, several particular cases are tested by a general rule to see if they flow from it. If all particular cases can be explained by this rule, then the universality of the rule is inferred, including all subsequent cases, even those that are not given in themselves. A similar formulated mental figure can also be found in the second part of the appendix 
referring to the ideas, God, world, and soul. Starting from the field of possible experience, an object in the idea is concluded. This object in the idea serves only to represent other objects to us in accordance with their systematic unity. Thus, it is possible to derive, this is a quote, the object of experience as it were from the imagined object of this idea as its ground or cause in the form of an as if. With the object in the idea, we think a relation to the sum total of experience appearances, which is analogous, and this is crucial here, which is analogous to the relation that appearances have to one another. For this reason, Kant concludes that there is, and this is again a quote, not the least thing to hinder us from assuming these ideas as objective and hypostatic, end of quotation. Well, what do we see here? In both parts of the appendix, Kant formulates a reciprocal inference in which he combines the inferences of induction, subsumption, and analogy. The principles of homogeneity, specification, continuity build the transcendental presupposition of these inferences. The idea is God, world, and soul, but also the ideas we use in chemistry, the elements, or in anthropology, the ladder of continuity, or in astronomy, the movement of celestial bodies. These ideas are universal rules, which are inferred based on individual cases and which we can apply to individual cases, even those that are not given in themselves. Well, this is one mental figure we can find in both parts of the appendix. There's another completely different mental figure in both parts, not even an other mental figure, but also a disqualification of this old form of teleology, which I have described above. Kant says that old this uh, describes this form of teleology starting from individual cases as lazy reason, ignava ratio. On the contrary, he says, we make a purposiveness in accordance with the universal laws, the crown. In this context, Kant always speaks in analogy of understanding and reason. In accordance with the analogy of a causal determination, the different laws should be systematically connected through reason. And he writes, as understanding unites the manifold into an object through concepts, so reason on its side unites the manifold of concepts through ideas. This approach is most clear in the following quote. Reason never relates directly to an object, but solely to, to the understanding and by means of it to reason's own empirical use. Hence, it does not create any concepts of object, but only orders them and gives them that unity which they can have in their greatest possible extension. Out of quotation. The concepts of reason become, in this sense, maxims based solely on the speculative interest of reason, even though Kant writes it may seem as if they were objective principles. Well, we see Kant formulates two different mental figures, a teleological concept which uh, uh, has to function as a second order principle and a teleological conception starting from individual cases, concluding universal rules. What Kant lacks in 1781 is an explicit decision between the various functions and forms of teleological thinking and linked to this a clarification of the relationship between final and efficient causes. In the critique of the power of judgment, however, he has already clarified this ambiguity in the form of structure, in the form and structure of final causes in natural science. Thereby, the reflective power of judgment forms a capacity that is not directed to suit the cognition, but to cognition in general. It reflects the condition under which specific cases can be the object of human cognition, although they allude to the objective cognition of the principles of understanding. He writes, as for what occasions it, this principle is of course to be derived from experience, but cannot rest merely on grounds in experience. It must have as its ground some sort of a priori principle even if it is merely a regulative and even if that end lies only in the idea of the one who judges and never in an efficient cause. 
Thus, the need to recognize the manifoldness of specific phenomena becomes the occasion for the power of judgment to reflect the relation and the possible purposiveness of the capacities. In this sense, the reflecting power of judgment, and this is another quotation, attributes nothing at all to the object of nature, but rather only represents the unique way in which we can proceed in reflecting on the object of nature with the aim of a thoroughly interconnected experience. End of quotation. Fine, uh, individual phenomena are therefore the starting point for teleological reflections and do not serve for an understanding of nature in an ideographic sense. Moreover, in the antinomy and its resolution of the critique of the power of judgment, Kant explicitly clarifies the primacy of mechanics over teleology, according to which the natural scientist is instructed to follow it as far as possible. This primacy, however, does not make teleology superfluous, but installs it as an independent view to nature. Physics, developed in, uh, physics is developed in regard to the metaphysical foundations of natural science as a discipline in which teleology does not play an imminent role, as paragraph 68 makes clear. Arithmetical and geometrical analogies, as well as, and this is crucial in my context, universal mechanical laws. No matter how strange and astonishing the unification of different and apparent entirely independent rules in a single principle in them may seem, can make no claim on that account to be teleological grounds of explanation within physics. Out of quotation. When Kant speaks here of the unification of entirely independent rules in a single principle, he is again indirectly alluding to Maupertuis' principle of least action. At this stage of Kant's development, the principle no longer plays a role for the foundation of mechanics, and physics gets along without teleological explanation. Well, in my last part, I want to, tell, want to see again the appendix and the contradictions of the appendix coming from Maupertuis' differentiation and to check what we can gain if we have Maupertuis' differentiation between old and new teleology in the background. Unsolved problems of the critique of pure reason, section four. Montpetrie's differentiation between an old and new teleology allows to separate analytically various incompatible elements of Kant's conception of teleology. However, it is important to note that this distinction is not an unrestricted standard for Kant. He, constant, he constantly undermines it. At the same time, it becomes evident that Kant lacks in 1781 a critical examination between the various forms of teleology and a choice among these proofs, which explicitly was demanded by Montpetrie. Regardless of the methodological transformation of teleology in the appendix, Kant's approach oscillates between three extremes. Firstly, Kant reduces the regulative principles or ideas to mere auxiliary means of the principles of understanding and thus deprives them of their independent dignity within the framework of natural science. Second, the regulative principles or ideas are developed for a systematic unity and therefore as a second order reason, an order condition. Thirdly, Kant develops the regulative principles or ideas as a systematic unity of nature in the empirical use of reason, whereby these can be understood in a specific way as belonging to the object. It is remarkable, on the one hand, that the latter two interpretations renew and reproduce Montpetrie's old and new teleology. On the other hand, the ambiguity in Kant's teleological concept are reflected in the current research question concerning the necessity of regulative principles and ideas, that is the categorical, the system, and ideational in reading. It becomes clear that all three positions in the question of the status of teleological principles have text immanent proofs, but also a systematic explanation deficit. I will show you that. The categorical interpretation is based entirely on the core function of the transcendental analytic, in which Kant 
describes the pr transcendental principles of understanding as sufficiently necessary. In this sense, the regulative use of reason has to be, is indirectly connected to the principles of understanding. What is lacking in this interpretation is a clarification how the principles of understanding, how the regulative use of reason can have an independent role in natural science, which is important with regard to the metaphysical foundations of natural science, because the ideas guarantee rational natural science, and in doing so, the differentiation between proper and improper science. Well, this is a problem for the categorical interpretation. The system interpretation, in turn, corresponds to the concept of the principle of least action as introduced by Montpetri, especially in the status, because it is, as the principle, a second-order conception. It is a second-order conception in regard to the principles of understanding. In contrast to Montpetri, Kant introduces separate supreme touchstones in chemistry, biology, astronomy, and empirical psychology. What is lacking in the system interpretation is a clarification, uh, and this is what McNulty has shown in his paper from 2015, is a clarification how the insights gained through the regulative use of reason can have an effect for, of the constitutive ones. Based on this problem, McNulty and other interpreters have introduced the so-called ideational interpretation. This is a reading which points clearly toward to the solution of the, of the teleological judgment and is, in this sense, the most promising approach in Kant's conception. Although, in the framework of the critique of pure reason, it stands in contrast to Kant's claim of a sufficient and necessary validity of the principles of understanding, where we can find a lot of text proofs in the first part of the critique. Well, Based on this ambiguity, and this is my last sentence or my last point, a final clarification of the relationship between nexus effectivus or nexus finalis is not possible in the context of the first critique. Coming from Maupertuis' differentiation, this offers an explanation for the different approaches in the status of regulative principles, the categorical, the system, and the ideational interpretation. All three positions have taxonomic and proofs, but also a systematic explanation deficit. Kant lacks a critical examination between the different forms of teleological thinking. He has not yet decided which form of teleology the critical project is compatible with. I think he has exactly this in mind when he writes in paragraph 60 of the Prolegomena that there is an unsolved problem in the panics. Thank you very much for your attention.